Okay, this is it. Lecture number 10, the last one. So we've got four little tiny chapters. Um, not a lot to cover, not all that important, but let's do it just so we get them all done. All right, let's start with chapter 22, double inlet ventricle. All right, with double inlet ventricle, you start off with two normal atria and there are two AV valves. But one ventricle receives both atrial outputs. The other ventricle is usually just rudimentary, and rudimentary means um, basic or barely formed. So what you've got is a very tiny ventricle that doesn't really count, and you have two normal-sized atrias that are both emptying into that univentricle. Now, this single ventricle is usually, like 80% of the time, a morphologic left ventricle, which, as you remember, the morphologic right is a heavily trabeculated um, interior of the ventricle. Heavy, one of the trabeculations is the moderator band. Um, but yes, we've got a kind of smooth ventricle, which is the morphologic left ventricle most of the time. All right, here's a nice diagram. And basically, there's this little teeny-weeny right ventricle off to the side. The SV there stands for single ventricle. And you've got two normal size atria with normal AV valves, and they just happen to be dumping into this univentricle. Um, sometimes it really is obvious that there's really only one ventricle there, but other times you've got this little pocket off to the side, which is a rudimentary ventricle. That's enough to confuse you, but um, yeah. The main thing about those, and we'll talk about more about how you differentiate that tiny ventricle from other things like a hypoplastic left heart or right heart. All right. Well, in general, um, there's a there's a, a missing septum. So the ultrasound picture on the left there is uh, a very good picture of two normal atria going through two normal atrioventricular valves into a single ventricle. That's a univentricle there. And then over on the other side, there's some, a couple other examples there. All right. Now, it may look like hypoplastic left heart, but the one thing is, um, is that there is this very, very large VSD to the point where it doesn't really even count as a septum. And when you're talking about double inlet ventricle, that VSD is referred to as a bulboventricular foramen. All right. Now, when you have a double inlet ventricle, you know, the problem is, is really the ventricle, but the arrangement of outflow tracts is also an issue. So they are very often parallel. So we've seen parallel vessels in transposition. We've seen parallel vessels in double outlet right ventricle. Well, double inlet right, well, double inlet ventricle also counts as one with parallel alpha low tracks. Well, the prognosis for the baby is really dependent on which is the dominant ventricle. If it is a morphologic left ventricle that is the big one, then they do better. Basically, left ventricles are better long-term pumps. All right. So if you suspect a univentricular heart, what you're interested in is, are there two patent AV valves? And that's a really important uh, distinction. Because if there are, it slides you over into double inlet ventricle uh, and away from other reasons for having a tiny ventricle.
All right, let's talk about tricuspid atresia. So tricuspid atresia, remember stenosis is a narrowing and an atresia is a complete lack of formation. So when you have tricuspid atresia, there is no communication between the right atrium and ventricle. Now very often, tricuspid atresia is referred to as tricuspid atresia with ventricular septal defect, since there always has to be a VSD. Now, it's usually an inlet type of VSD, you know, right next to the um, tricuspid and mitral valves, um, or a perimembranous VSD. And what that does is it allows blood to get uh, to the pulmonary artery. Now, so the way that happens is, you know, the blood normally pumps from RA to RV, but here nothing can get through. So the way that the blood gets out that pulmonary artery is it has to go from the right atrium through the foramen ovale to the left atrium, then to the left ventricle. There it kind of mixes with the right ventricle through this large VSD and then out through the pulmonary artery. So it takes a long way to get there. Now, as a consequence, the foramen ovale is often quite large. Um, you, and there also can be a, an atrial septal defect from all this heavy load of blood going through there. Because basically, instead of a bunch of it going to the left atrium and then a bunch going to the right ventricle, all of it has to go by way of the left atrium. Now, the fact that there is so much blood going from right atrium over to the left, normally there's only the part that's kind of squirted across by the IVC, but here it's all of it. So very often, not only will the foramen ovale, the actual hole be bigger, the flap of the foramen ovale is also typically stretched out and bulging further into the left atrium. All right, so tricuspid atresia with ventricular septal defect. Here, we've got a tiny ventricle. We've had a tiny ventricle a couple times now, but here the tiny ventricle is caused by little or no flow um, in or little or no flow out. Oh, sorry, I lost it there. In general, a tiny ventricle is caused by little or no flow in or little or no flow out. That's what in general causes a tiny ventricle. But with tricuspid atresia with VSD, the problem is that there is lack of flow in. That is the reason. So let's go actually back to that slide. Um, and again, it's helpful to look at these multiple times. Um, this kind of looks somewhat similar to uh, the last thing that we talked about, which is double inlet ventricle. Just because one ventricle is way bigger than the other one, and you got the other one off to the side. So as you can see, what differentiates this from double inlet ventricle is, well, actually there are not two inlets, there's only one inlet. The tricuspid doesn't communicate at all. All right, so to here's, um, just an example of color flow, you know, all of it going through left atrium to left ventricle, and then it kind of meanders its way into the right ventricle, and then finally out the pulmonary artery. All right, well, with pulmonary atresia, um, very often it does occur with pulmonary atresia, so you've got Wait a minute, you got no inflow, and now we're saying there's pulmonary atresia, so no outflow. Um, well, how do you know if the small right ventricle is caused from the small outflow or inflow? Well, the one thing about this is um, with tricuspid atresia, there is zero flow in. Um, and so that tips you off that this is a problem with uh, inflow. Now, if there's pulmonary atresia, obviously there's a 
problem with outflow too, but there's both. Um, whereas if you just had pulmonary atresia, you would still have blood going from right atrium to right ventricle, just not very much. All right, so here's a picture of um, tricuspid atresia. And basically, this is a, a, you know, a 3D picture. Um, you can see tiny right ventricle. You can see that there is a thick dysplastic tricuspid valve with no flow in it. Um, since all the blood has to go from the right atrium to the left atrium, the foramen ovale is very large. There's a large interatrial connection. And then finally, there is a VSD that goes with it. All right. So this is a, a really good one. A small right ventricle. All right. The first thing is, is there a VSD at all? Well, if there is no VSD, you have eliminated um, uh, tricuspid atresia because it always comes with a VSD. All right, Epstein anomaly and tricuspid dysplasia. So Epstein's anomaly is a problem with the tricuspid valve. And the problem is primarily the septal leaflet. There are three leaflets and one of them attaches to the septum. The septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve is normally just a little bit apically displaced. But this one is dramatically apically displaced. So we've got the septal leaflet attached to the septum like it's supposed to, but it's way down the septum, very close to the apex of the heart. Um, in fact, it used to be, you know, the septal leaflet is part of the annulus, you know, like it's in that Mercedes symbol sign. Here with Epstein anomaly, um, the septal and posterior leaflets aren't even attached to the annulus. They go down to attach directly to the myocardium. Now, when you have an atri uh, atrioventricular valve that is so far down toward the apex, well, that kind of makes the ventricle small um, and the atrium big. So if you move the dividing line between the atrium and the ventricle way down into the ventricle, now the ventricle is functionally smaller. And this is termed atrialization of the right ventricle, meaning what Part of the stuff that used to be right ventricle is now part of the right atrium. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the tricuspid regurgitation. Um, just, just, okay. All right. So with tricuspid um, regurgitation, what you've got is, um, so, the leaflets aren't set up normally. You've got this one septal leaflet and potentially the posterior leaflet way down on the septum. And this tricuspid valve no longer is competent. So if it's not competent, it has regurgitation. And that regurgitation, um, that high velocity uh, jet that blows into the atrium enlarges the atrium, and it massively enlarges the right atrium. Now, unlike regular old tricuspid regurgitation that can happen for a number of reasons, the tricuspid regurgitation that ha is associated with Epstein's anomaly starts way down in the ventricle. Normally, the little jet starts you know, right up at that AV valve, and the AV valve is up in its normal place. So that's where a jet would normally start. But if you have an, a tricuspid valve that is pushed way down into the ventricle, well, the tricuspid regurgitated jet is going to start way down in the ventricle. So that's the thing that kind of tips you off. Sometimes all the septal attachment and so forth is not that easy to see. Um, but this jet that's starting way down low, that's really the thing that tips you off. Well, what are the consequences? 
Well, first of all, there's massive cardiomegaly, particularly because the right atrium is massive. And in the picture at the right, you can see that the heart takes up the entire chest. So massive cardiomegaly, um, high drops, um, at some point, this heart fails and you start getting fluid collections because um, the heart has completely lost its efficiency. Um, you know, if the ventricle, every time it pumps, instead of all of it going out um, through the pulmonary artery, um, most of it goes back into the right atrium, that's not a very efficient way of pumping. Basically, everything just goes back and forth uh, and the heart doesn't do its job. Um, Sometimes you can get a tachydysrhythmia. Sometimes that super stretched out atrium can get very irritable and start dysrhythmias. Um, and then we've got pulmonary hypoplasia. And that's really the big deal. If you've got a heart, particularly a right atrium, that is filling the entire chest, the lungs don't grow. All right. Now, okay. Um, it tends to be um, an isolated finding when you have Epstein's anomaly. Um, it can still be associated with other things. Um, it used to be a frequently, well, had a reputation of being associated with lithium. Um, it doesn't have that same correlation we used to think, but if you see it on the test, lithium and Epstein's anomaly do go together. Um, it is seen with trisomy 21 also. Um, the prognosis tends to be poor. In fact, half of them die in utero. Um, people have tried to figure out you know, the, how you can predict the outcome. And it turns out that the bigger the right atrium is, the worse the baby does for a number of reasons. If the, if the right atrium is really big, it usually implies that there's not a lot of right ventricle filling. So it's not an efficient heart. So it leads to high drops. And if you have a very large right atrium, you've also got a very high risk of severe pulmonary hypoplasia. Let's talk about tricuspid valve dysplasia. So um, I guess technically Epstein's anomaly it does fall into that category. Um, we've got them separated here. Uh, both of them are uh, dysfunctional tricuspid valves. But tricuspid valve dysplasia is basically um, a very thickened tricuspid valve. The leaflets are thick and dysplastic. Now, um, typically, the insertion is still normal. So you still have that apical displacement of the tricuspid valve. The problem is the leaflets are very thick and dysplastic. And not only, well, they're thick and dysplastic, they don't work very well. They um, allow regurgitation. So <clears throat> whenever you're talking about a valve, primary function, it's to keep stuff from going back the wrong way. And if it regurgitates, it's incompetent. So that's the problem with tricuspid valve dysplasia. So Epstein's and tricuspid valve dysplasia, they both have very large right atria due to holosystolic regurgitation. Holosystolic means that the, through the entire um, systole of the ventricle, it's going the wrong way. Um, they both have a similar prognosis um, and both uh, are associated with right ventricular outflow uh, obstruction. Whether that's um, a result of not much right ventricular output or not, I'm not sure, but pulmonary stenosis goes along with it. So, um, as you can imagine, that's a bad combination. So if the right ventricle is trying to do its work by contracting and sending all the blood through the pulmonary artery, well, 
If the tricuspid fails and half the blood goes back the wrong way into the right atrium and there's obstruction to the right ventricular outflow tract, that makes it even worse. So um, there's nothing holding it back from going into the atrium and there's a lot holding it back from going out the PA like it's supposed to. Um, and certainly, if you have pulmonary stenosis, obviously the regurge is worse um, and earlier. All right, let's do a little talk on tricuspid valve regurgitation. Um, so, um, whenever you have tricuspid valve regurgitation, normally what happens is as the right ventricle contracts, the valves are started to be pushed back to a closed position. Now, while that's happening, a little bit of blood does actually go through the middle before they get closed. So very often you will have a tiny amount of blood flowing the wrong direction in the process of closing the leaflets. And, but sometimes um, it's, it's more than that. It is a holosystolic thing. So early systole, you're really just kind of closing the valves. Holosystole, that means at no point do the valves ever work. So whenever you're looking at tricuspid valve uh, regurgitation, one of the things that you're interested in is the width of the jet. And that width of the jet is called the vena contracta. When you grade tricuspid regurgitation, um, unlike the, the semilunar valve ones, which were 100 to 200 and 200 plus, um, these are a little shifted on the lower end. So mild regurge is 30 to 100 centimeters per second. Um, remember, in general, any regurge is not normal. Um, but if you have mild, it's going kind of fast, but not that fast. Moderate's 100 to 200, and severe is over 200. Basically, over 200 severe for all of these valve velocities that we're talking. So 200 severe, basically, for everything. Here's some differences in the uh, length or duration of regurgitation. We've got uh, some very early systolic on the left, and we have holosystolic. Holosystolic meaning it takes up the whole um, period between the two inlet ones above it. There's something called trivial regurgitation, and for the most part, that is what we're talking about is early systolic um, regurgitation, which may have to do with just the blood moving backwards to close the valves. Um, but it could be a little bit more than that. It can be a higher velocity. Generally, trivial regurgitation is less than 200. It's a very narrow jet, a narrow vena contracta. And you look for everything else, and you can't find anything else. So you have no explanation. That kind of describes what trivial regurgitation is. And trivial regurge can be normal transiently in normal fetuses. All right. Well, what are some um, associations with tricuspid regurge? Well, trisomy 21. So if you see tricuspid regurge in the early detailed ultrasound, you're thinking Down syndrome. All right, some etiologies of tricuspid regurge. Well, one of the things is outflow obstruction. So if you're really trying to jam blood out of the right ventricle by way of the pulmonary artery and there's pulmonary stenosis, um, you can start to have failure of the tricuspid valve. Um, so outflow obstruction is one reason. Another reason you can have tricuspid regurge, which is important to keep remembering, is volume overload. If for some reason, uh, I mean, generally everything kind of keeps pace. So the baby's blood volume goes up, the baby's heart gets bigger, the baby gets bigger, everything kind of goes together. But if one of those things kind of gets ahead, like the volume of blood, um, you've got lots of volume 
and the heart hasn't grown to accept that yet with gestational age, um, that can be a reason for tricuspid regurg. And the way that tends to happen is the ventricles get big because of the volume and the valves no longer meet in the middle. They don't co-apt. So volume overload um, is a reason you can have tricuspid regurg. So if you see tricuspid regurg, you're thinking of you know primary problems with the valve, like dysplastic or Epstein's anomaly. You're thinking about outflow obstruction. The RV can't get it out the right way, so it sends it back to the right atrium. And then lastly, things that would cause volume overload. Sometimes you will see it with dysrhythmias, um, not only um, tachydysrhythmias, but also heart block also. And here's another rare cause of tricuspid regurg. What it is is an atrial myxoma. An atrial myxoma, a myxoma is basically this tumor that's kind of made of jello, and it's in there flopping about. So this is an atrial myxoma, and what happens is sometimes you can see in the upper right corner, it's sitting up nicely in the right atrium, but then other times it kind of slips down um, and keeps the you know, tricuspid doors from closing, and you see this regurg from that. So if you see a tumor inside the atrium um, or ventricle, you're thinking atrial myxoma. Most of the tumors that we see um, are things like rhabdomyomas, which are really, um, their origin is in the wall of the uterus. Um, here, this is thing is actually floating inside the atrium. Another example of volume overload would be the twin-to-twin -twin transfusion recipient, um, that they relatively suddenly get extra volume and their heart has not grown um, as fast. So now this volume overload causes a increasing size of the heart, particularly the right ventricle, and the valves no longer close. Here's some other reasons for volume overload. Um, one of them is a, a fetal arteriovenous fistula. Um, what else do we have? We have a chorioangioma as a possibility. Um, so these things with overload can cause regurgitation as well. Here's another cute slide um, indicating things that would cause tricuspid regurg by way of uh, overload, volume overload. All right, and here's just a picture to kind of tell you there are lots of things that can cause, uh, you know, right ventricular obstruction or right ventricular overload. And here, they got them all spread out, and you can see there are lots of things to think about when you see tricuspid regurgitation. And you can look at this slide at your leisure. And that will be it for this entire thing. Thank you for your attention.